Hi, ladies and gentlemen, Bill Jordan here. Uh, this is R with Bill. We do candid video interviews. If you're a painter, sculptor, or a candlestick maker, this is where you need to be. People buy from people they know. And the best way for them to know you is with my candid video interview. Now, today we have a very special treat with a lady all the way from, well, we'll find out where she's from when she talks to us. But let's bring on Miss Carolyn Young. Hey, Carolyn, how are you doing today? Hey, Bill, I'm doing great. All right, you looking good? You feeling good? <laughs> yes, I am. All right. So, Carolyn, we had a chance uh, to chat yesterday and we were just getting warmed up. And we have one particular thing in common. That's we both belong or graduated from the University of Hawaii, right? Correct. Yeah. Nice place. I, I like it. There's. <laughs> it was a more of a party school, actually. <laughs> well, now, come on. Now, we got a party sometime. <laughs> <laughs> so now. I it there. My, um, have, I still have a lot of good friends there right now. Right. You know, amazingly, in, over here in New York, they have, they have a UH Hawaii club. Really? Yeah, every year the people from, from Hawaii, you know, they meet in Central Park. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so tell us, Carolyn, you, you do these fantastic artworks and, and you started out in Hong Kong, is that right? Correct. Uh, I took Chinese brush painting. I started classes when I was 15, took three years in Hong Kong. And then I went to University of Hawaii intending to major in French. And there I met my mentor, Lamoy Char, who was teaching continuing education courses at UH at, in the evenings and she was teaching Chinese brush painting. So I was so struck by the way that she did her paintings and how she blended the mythology, the culture and the history of China together with the paintings that I switched my major to art. Wow, heavy transition, right? Yes. What, what was the, you know, what was the, what was your thinking? What, what did she say to you that, that moved you from right to left? Um, not anything in particular. It was mo uh, more like she linked up the images with specific history or stories. And um, I just thought it was a great way to be painting. Uh, something that's not just representational, but something that was from my own background. Right. So you 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 were you were thirsty for that that energy. The culture thing. Yes. <laughs> let's, let's speak about that. Why is why is that so relevant for you? Um, I think that. Well, I was adopted for one. My parents were expatriates from America. You know, they were born and raised in Hawaii and then went back to Hong Kong after World War II to start a family. And I was adopted in Hong Kong, so I really didn't have roots per se. I didn't know who my biological parents were. They adopted me when I was 11 months. So in a way, it was my way of searching for my roots. Not that I wanted to find my biological parents, but it was in an effort to understand myself a little bit more. How has that played out? Oh, it's been wonderful. It's so much fun getting to know all these stories. Uh, the way that you guys would, I mean, people in America would grow up knowing Cinderella, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. I know about Chang'e, the uh, goddess in the moon. And I come here and I start painting these stories. And I'm meeting with second, third, fourth generation Chinese people here. And th they take such an interest in the work because they remember their grandmothers or parents telling them these stories when they were kids but they never grasp the true meaning of it or how it would relate to themselves. And now that they're grown ups, they want to know a little bit more about themselves. So for them, it's um, getting to know themselves and their roots as well. So that's pretty powerful. Yes. And I get a lot of um, requests 
from groups that sponsor, you know, the kids, uh, the adoptions from China. Okay. And the parents would buy my work or they'll buy my coffee table art book because mm -hmm. it's got the images and the stories on one side, the image on the other side. Oh. And they buy this book for their children that they have adopted from China so that the kids being brought up as American citizens, they would still know their cultural background. That's, that's very, very significant. I'm, I'm, I'm happy for you. And so now, did you really find out who you are? <laughs> <laughs> I found out why I well I what makes me tick the way that I do yeah. you know uh, have you ever read Amy Tan's um, Joy Luck Club or better still Kitchen God's Wife I don't know yeah. that one I know I know the, 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 uh, the Joy Luck Club yes uh, well in Kitchen God's Wife actually it's about this young woman who was brought up American and her mother is from the old country. And the thought process is so Chinese for her mother. There's this one part, I'm sorry, I'm digressing, but no, it's- no, in no, this is interesting, I like it. <laughs> There's one part where she says, um, the daughter says, well, I was, I got this great job and my mother said something that made me doubt that it's a great job because I was so excited about getting it. I told her I was one of three people chosen. I was chosen out of three people for this job. And my mother said, what? Only three other people wanted this job? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I, I mean, only two other people wanted this job. So it's such a typically Chinese way uh, uh, to think about this. Could it's almost you, like cup you, half empty. You, <laughs> and that, what does that mean, Zach? I'm not getting the full significance of that. What does that mean? Well, most people, when they say, you know, like brought up as Americans, we say, wow, I got chosen out of two, you know, three people there for that job, and I was the one who won this job. I did well. Right. He says, oh, you were one out of three. That means only two other people wanted this job, so it couldn't have been such a great job. Oh, I see. So it has to be the more people who want it, that makes it more valuable. Yes. <laughs> wow. But it's so cultural. It's such yes. a cultural way of looking at it. And I'm not quite sure whether somebody growing up in America would even think that way. Well, no, I, we don't. But I'm, I'm, I'm just, that's why I'm asking you to, to share with me what's the question is. Is there it's any? It's amusing. <laughs> so, so now you went to study French and then you, you, you shifted your major to art. Did you major in art or what happened? Well, I always wanted to major in French. Uh, I took five years of French in Hong Kong growing up, and that would have been equivalent to, to third year in college French. So I had a facility for it, and it came easily to me. So I thought, well, I'll just go to University of Hawaii, I'll major in French. But then I took the continuing education art class at night, met Lamoy Char, who is my mentor, and because of her stories, um, I mean, the historical part, the cultural part that's integrated with her paintings, it made me change my major to major in art instead of French. Right. It has such a great impact. She had such a great impact on me. And the, the art department, was that, did they have what you were looking for? Or was no. It yeah <laughs> actually not uh i switched to um painting okay in the art department and all we had were oils they didn't ha they didn't even have um watercolors or acrylics at that time it was just wow. strictly oils so because i needed to get a degree in art i had to do oils but i kept up with my chinese brush painting at night with lamoy char okay so in the end, when I graduated, I kind of put the two together. I took the color palette, meaning the color combinations, the brighter colors 
of the Western art oil paintings uh -huh. and blended it with the techniques and the stories and the images. All right. The Chinese work. Because Chinese of, art is very, very muted. Yes, you know, I was going to say, a lot of it is muted. It's very, you know, subdued. The values are very saturated. Yes. Hmm, okay. So I'll tell you what, if, is it okay with you? Can I just go through some of the images you can talk about them as we go through? That'd be great. All right. All right, there you go. Well, I did a series of black and white, well, actually ink and wash on watercolor paper. And this particular one is a great story behind it. It's a very well-known Chinese legend. Her name was Chang'e, and she was the goddess of the moon. Yes. You see the rabbit on the side, you see yes. the moon in the background there. Yes. And in her right hand, she's holding the potion of immortality. Oh, yes. Okay. So I don't know if you've ever heard of that legend, Chinese people believe that when the earth was first created, there were 10 suns circling the skies, causing great havoc and famine. And so the emperor called on his favorite archer, Yi, to shoot down nine of these suns and leave the one we know today in the sky. As a, Yi did just that, and as a reward, he was given the potion of immortality, and he became emperor after the old emperor died. Well, when he became emperor, he taxed the pe peasants relentlessly, so he was very cruel. And his wife, the beautiful Chang'e, whom you see in this painting here, uh, she decided if her husband lived forever, the peasants would never be free of him. Mm -hmm. So one night she stole his potion of immortality and she drank it. She drank too much and she started to rise up into the night sky. And together with the rabbit, she comes to rest in the moon, where people, Chinese people believe she lives there till today. So every year we celebrate the Mid-Autumn Moon Festival. This is usually in mid-September. Okay. And um, we drink a toast to the lady in the moon. We eat moon cakes shaped like rabbits. <laughs> and we say that night when you look up in the moon, you see not the man in the moon that the Western culture knows. We see the rabbit in the moon. And he's crazy <laughs> with the mortar and pestle. And he's formulating some more potion of immortality for his mistress to drink. Wow. Now, I like that story. That's a great story. Fun story. And this, this is a, such a well-composed piece. I, mean, I see your... Your, your, your arc going up from, from, the, from the bottom left all the way up through her, to her head, back to the moon, and back around. Great, good, that, that flow is really nice. Thank this, you. This is black and white, right? Yes, just ink and wash. Um, is this your, is this your, 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 your bonji technique? Uh, gongbi, gongbi Gong technique, yes. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. where you just layer it on a little at a time. Uh, the shading to create a three-dimensional look to it. And for those who don't know, give us an idea, how long would a piece like this take? Well, this one was relatively fast compared to the ones on silk, full okay. color. Mm -hmm. Full color ones on silk, if it's like 20 inches by 30 inches, that's the full size, that's the biggest size I paint these days. Um, that would take anywhere between six to eight weeks and sometimes more. And that's working eight, 10 hours a day, six days a week. It's because the technique is uh, watering, uh, diluting the uh, watercolor down till it's just colored water. And you're basically dyeing the silk oh, one I layer see. at a time. Oh. And you have to wait in between the layers for it to dry. Right, I see. The shaping, the highlighting. So in the faces, to come to the final point in the face where the eyes are in and the features and the skin tones, that's anywhere between 18 to 24 layers of very light washes. But then what it does is it gives you total control over your medium. Mm -hmm. Because if it's looking a little too much, too much red in, one way, uh, in the skin tones, 
you can blend a little yellow and green and you know just do a thin layer over there and it tones down the red you know what i mean you're an artist you know exactly what i mean <laughs> we're just trying to talk to for the folks who might not have your your level of expertise you know. <laughs> So okay, let's 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 move on. We'll get back to that when we get to the to the silk. Let's move on to the black and whites. Now, now I when, use some of black and here? whites to do more contemporary pieces. You know, kind of tongue in cheek type of thing. I and see this that. is one of them. And this one is called selfie for obvious reasons. Yes. <laughs> so now, now is, is, is there a now? the first piece we had mythological overtone right the the more contemporary pieces don't have stories behind them not like that okay no not like that all right What's so this? there again <laughs> another contemporary piece and fun piece this one is called monkey see monkey do for ah. reasons see everyone's texting and the monkey's doing it too right <laughs> so so this made me think of no, the, the three monkeys. Ah, yes. See no evil, evil right. hear no evil, speak no evil. Yeah, right. Yes. And so what's, what's the motivation behind these more contemporary? Well, this one, this particular one, I did it last year because it was year of the monkey. Oh, okay. And I was searching uh, for pictures of monkeys, uh, thinking I would do like a full on color piece with a monkey. And I came across this photograph of this macaque that's in the hot springs in Japan, you know, and I, I forget where it is in Japan that has the hot springs and the snow is falling and the monkeys are in the spring, mm. you know, bathing and keeping warm. Well, anyway, there was a photograph of this monkey and only his head was showing above the water, and he was holding this um, iPhone. <laughs> his hair was wet, and he had the iPhone, and it looked like he was texting. So I thought, hey, that, that would make a great painting. Yes. You know how the young people these days love to text one another, even though they're just sitting in a row, they're right next to each other. It's yes. kind of a commentary on today's youth. Yes. That's true. Okay, let's go to the next one here. Oh. Now that is Guan Yin, very famous goddess. She's the goddess of mercy, and she is the epitome of beauty and grace and benevolence. They say that Guan Yin is always pictured with the willow branch in her right hand, and that symbolizes um, strength and perseverance. In her left hand, she holds the flask of holy water pointing down always to bless her true believers on earth. Mm -hmm. And she said to go travel from heaven down to earth on the back of the mighty dragon. Ah. So that's the story behind that piece. Now what, what's all, what are all those, the waves, you know? Like, oh yes, so now, Kuan Yin is always also said to be the patron saint of sailors. Oh. So when the sailors get into a fierce storm at sea mm. and the waves are threatening to uh, overturn the boats, they pray to Kuan Yin for help and she's seen riding to their rescue on the back of the dragon through the waves. Wow, now, that's a good story. Man. <laughs> now, is it, this on like paper? This or is on silk. This one is on silk. So you see the flesh tones on this piece yes this is it's very smooth it has a translucent quality to the flesh tones this is something you can't get up with uh, painting on paper okay. only on the silk and that's that's how you get that that translucent red in the, in the, in the cream well that. she looks so soft and so yeah. feminine yes yes smooth gradations of colors in her um face and her hands yes. now, Funny part, if I did male figures on silk, yes. not a good thing because the males start looking kind of feminine. Okay. <laughs> so okay. the male figures are better on paper. Oh, okay. This for is, me, at least. This is, this is beautiful. All right, let's go right along. Okay. Ah, uh, this is Li Wa. Now, 
See the painting in the back of her? That's actually from a very famous painting that was painted during the, uh, I think, Song Dynasty. Mm -hmm. And it's, the painting is depicting an outing for the very famous um, concubine of the Tang Dynasty uh, that's called Yang Guifei. But anyway, this is how I juxtapose something that's more contemporary, it, not contemporary, but the colors are brighter in the foreground. Yes. But the ones in the background totally muted. Right. That's, that's um, I've different. kind of done like um, traditional with my style in uh, a mix of both styles together in the same painting. It, it works for me. Thank um, you. Do, do you have any, any concepts on the, on the, on the uh, boss concubine? I mean, what's, you know what that's all about? Oh, well, the emperor, he has some, sometimes, he, some emperors have 5,000, 6,000 concubines. Okay. And one might say, how do you service five, 6,000 <laughs> concubines? You're only mm -hmm. one guy. Right. But what happens is that uh, he only sees maybe five or six of them. And the concubines spend their whole life uh, in solitude in the harem. They, some of them never get to see the emperor. And it's the eunuchs that, de that decide who to pick for the emperor's night out. And sometimes the emperor has his favorite, so she will be with him most of the time. So some of these concubines, they would bribe the eunuchs so that they get a chance to meet the emperor and service him, spend the night with him. Because I would imagine they'd be servicing each other. <laughs> That's why they were eunuchs. <laughs> No, no, no. I mean the, the, the concubines. I mean, you know, they. Oh. They I, mean, I mean, they're gonna be in there. How long do they live in there? All their lives or what? No. Sometimes, you know, uh, they'll be there for maybe five, six years, three, four years, and mm -hmm. they'll be let go with the em empress thanks, and he'll they'll be given a stipend or something like that. Okay. And cool. There are um, rich men would vie with each other to be able to marry one of these concubines. Oh, okay. So, so it, it, was, it was a good job. <laughs> it was a good thing, yes. All right. All right, let's go into another good story here. I like that one. <laughs> now, she was an em uh, empress favorite concubine. That one is Mei Fei. Mm -hmm. And he loved her so much, uh, he would only spend his nights with her. Mm -hmm. And she loved plum blossoms. So in the imperial palace, he ordered all these plum tr blossom trees to be planted just to see her smile. So he nicknamed her Mei Fei, which means plum blossom, uh, plum consort. Okay. Now what, now what, what do the consorts, do they actually, uh, you know, they, they serve as, as like a, uh, a, a helper, a uh, uh, person? Oh, no, it's, well, not helper. Uh, the, it's the empress wife that's not a, a empress. You know, it's like a mistress, so, but has an elevated status right. above a mistress. I and see. they have certain uh, they have certain classes of concubines oh, really? stuff that are uh, like imperial class and then down to the ones that just entered before okay i got you and what what is their daily routine do they just work out getting pretty old <laughs> they just hang around and gossip about each other i guess <laughs> okay well let's let's go on to the next one then now who's this this is a more contemporary piece so no story behind this really and I just wanted to do something different uh, than the concubines and um, the stories. Uh, this is obviously a young gal, maybe in, I would say probably around the 1970s, 1980s in China, in a more well-to-do family. Now, what, is she eating a, a fruit of some type? What is that? Oh, it's an apple in her hand. Okay. 
Actually, I did a black and white of this one. Uh, and instead of the apple in her hand, I did put an apple, but it's the I, iPhone apple. <laughs> wow. Excellent. I like that. that, that. Funny. I just well, that's, thought, oh, and that's, that's bad, Carolyn. That's the, you know the girl. You shouldn't have done that one. That's nice. I like that. That's good. You, you, you're very uh, subtly slick. I like that. Go ahead. <laughs> that sold right away. I wonder why. Yeah. <laughs> And now we have these nice, these nice flowing cranes. Yes, summer cranes. This is on silk. Ah. And this is a large piece, uh, 20 inches up and down by 40 inches across, pretty much the biggest size I ever do anymore now. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, and cranes are symbolic of long life, uh, longevity, and marital happiness. Okay. They say cranes would live a uh, thousand years. And they're also symbolic of good fortune, uh, good luck, and wisdom. So now, a person would buy this piece knowing this story, or you have to explain it to them, or how is that? I explain it to them, mm -hmm. yes. And they say... And you know what, by the way, um, Japanese, in the Japanese culture, when they have a wedding, they fold a thousand cranes and they string them up on a tree like that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's to symbolize happiness and good fortune and longevity for each year of the crane's life, what purported to live a thousand years. Wow. And that's tied into the, to the marriage ceremony. Yes. Now is that cranes, is that Chinese and Japanese? Yes, both. In fact, very, it's actually in Korean paintings as well. Oh. So that whole peninsula. Yeah, there. right there in the far east. So they're, they're into that crane stuff. Okay, what's this yes. one about? Okay, now this one was done on paper. This one is called Guardians of East and West in feng shui. Uh, you know what feng shui is. Yes. yes, right? yes. And so in feng shui, they say that the um, dragon is the guardian of the east and the white tiger guards the west. Okay. And they are a balance. They balance off each other because the dragon exerts uh, the male energy and the tiger is symbolic of female energy. So when you have both of them together, it's good feng shui. It looks like the, the yin yang symbol as well. Exactly, that's what it is. Yeah. I, I caught you, man. I caught that. <laughs> you didn't fool me. Right? Oh, this is my favorite. What, what's her name? Her name is Jen Hao. Uh -huh. Jen Hao. Uh, woman, this is part of a story that was in, uh, I think, around 200 AD. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was towards the end of the Han Dynasty. And um, when the first emperor of Chu ascended the throne, he heard about this beautiful girl, Zhen Hao. Mm -hmm. And she was famous for her beauty. So he sent for her and he liked what he saw and he made her his empress. But what he didn't know was his younger brother had already met her and the two of them had fallen deeply in love with each other. Okay. So what the emperor wants, the emperor gets. She be goes on to become the empress, and she bears him two sons. Mm. Well, through the years, she and the emperor's um, brother would meet in secret to lament the se their separation, but they never betrayed the emperor. Right. Well, after bearing the emperor his sons, the emperor got tired of her and moved on to a new um, favorite. And so she was very bitter about this because she had to give up the man that she loved. And um, so she voiced her resentment and the emperor says, hey, I'm the emperor, I can do whatever I wanna do. And if you don't like it, I command you to commit suicide, he says to her. Well, one night as his brother, the emperor's brother was riding alongside the low river on his way back to the capital. And he stopped off on the banks there and he was deep in thought over this woman that he had loved all these years but could never have. And magically, there was the apparition, 
that appeared before him and it looked exactly like her. So he rushed up to greet her, but before he could get to her, uh, she vanished into thin air, leaving just a golden earring by the side of the road. Well, he took this to be a very bad omen. So he rushed back to the capital and there he heard about her death. Oh. And he was so broken hearty, hearted, he sat down that night, poured out his heart in the form of a poem called Lo Shen Fu. Mm. And that poem is studied till today in Chinese literature. Wow. All because yeah. of this woman that he loved. Yeah, yeah. But I'm curious, the emperor told her to, to, get, to get out. Now, would it, she, couldn't she have married the emperor's brother? No, that would have, she would have been beheaded for that. Oh, okay. So she, had, she couldn't marry anybody else? He commanded her to, to commit suicide. So mm -hmm. somehow or other, I don't know how she did it, but she committed suicide. Wow, man. Good story, though. Sad story. Unfortunately, yeah. most of these Chinese stories have sad endings. So it's, it's like singing the blues, huh? Yes. <laughs> I think only the fairy tales of Europe and America, we have happy endings. You know, the Chinese stories and the Russian yeah, stories. Yeah, they, they live happily blues. ever after, right? <laughs> yeah. That's true. Okay, who's this lady? Okay, that's Lady Alute. And Lady Alute was the wife of a Tang emperor. The Tang emperor, he was very young when he married her. He was only 17 when he married her. She was two years older than him. Uh -huh. And she came from a Manchurian um, noble family. Okay. Now, when, he, when the emperor was getting, he was old enough to get married. His mother, who was the famous Empress Dowager we hear about. Yes. He, uh, she got together four, I think five, five paintings, portraits, um, and had him choose which one he wanted to be his empress. Wow. He chose her. Okay. The other four became his concubines. Yes. And so, however, uh, when they got, after they got married, they were so much in love he never visited his concubines. And so the Empress Dowager frowned on this. He, she says, nah, this won't do. She's, this girl is wielding too much power over him. Oh. So she forced them to separate, but they pined for each other to the point he became so ill that he actually died from his illness. And she dies a few months afterwards. Sad, but that's historical truth, this one. And what's the butterfly for? Decorative. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually all, <laughs> we do all, we do things for all different reasons. Yeah, you, you had me looking underneath, looking all around. What, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this one is actually done on twenty-two karat gold leaf. Twenty-two karat gold. Yes, I use twenty-two karat gold leaf. And how how big is this piece? Uh, eighteen inches by eighteen inches. Mm. Yeah. Is that one, one uh, double gold or just one layer? Double layer. Uh-huh. See, I don't know about that gold leaf stuff. Good for you. <laughs> I do the gold leaf just because I want to, you know, uh, doing it on paper and um, it looks so nice when you have the gold leaf on the background there. You no, know, it makes it look je ne sais quoi. You know, it gives that, that special. It just elevates it, yes. you know, it gives it uh, an elegant feeling. Mm -hmm. It takes it on to another level to itself. And this is the, ah, the dragon. This is called the advent. Story behind this is great. So this is from Chinese mythology, but they also talk about this in Japanese um, tattoos, as, in fact. Okay. And they say that fish swimming up the Yellow River in China, uh, they have to go through a series of rapids called the Dragon Gate. Right. And the fish that get past Dragon Gate are transformed into mighty dragons and go on to live forever. Oh, okay. So they say the only fish that's ever been able to achieve this is the koi or the carp. 
Yeah. So therefore, the koi or carp symbolizes great strength, courage, and perseverance. And the, the uh, dragon symbolizes great power. So obviously, in this piece, this is done on paper, by the way. Okay. So this piece, uh, the koi has managed to get past Dragon Gate and has just been transformed into the dragon. Oh, okay. Now, this, this is good because, like, I'm thinking, yeah, that's like me. I'm, I'm the koi. I want to go upstream. And, yes. You know, I want to be dragging. <laughs> I'm jumping upstream, yeah, except man. it's the koi. <laughs> that's, that's cool, man. Cool stuff. All right. Ah, okay, this is your favorite. Uh, Tell, me ah. the story, Tell me the story. On 22 karat gold leaf again. Okay. Now, this is Ho Yi, the guy who shot down the suns. Yes. Well, they say that originally, the earth, when it was first out there, had 10 suns in the skies. And these suns were actually supposed to be the sun, S-O-N. Okay. Oh, the right. king of heaven. Ah, yes. And so each one was supposed to take turns going up into the sky to illuminate it for that day. Okay. Well, one day all the sun said, hey, let's have some fun. Let's just all go up there at the same time. So they all went up there and they had so much fun. They said, let's do this every day. So how many days of this resulted in all the famine? The uh, people couldn't even go outside of their houses. Animals were cowering in the shade and dying of thirst. Oh. And that's when the emperor called on Ho Yi, his favorite archer, to shoot down nine of these sons and leave the one we know today in the sky. And here's Ho Yi getting ready with his bow and arrow to shoot down the sons. Well, thank God for Ho Yi, right? Yes. <laughs> Because we, we used to be, you know, in famine and, 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 you know, hot weather, you know? Right, right. Why Thank you, have, you for him. Why did you have those two, those two uh, leopards? I knew you were going to ask me that, Bill. For the same reason there was a butterfly in the other room. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I wish there was a more interesting reason well, it's like in the first one what was the, the lady's name her, her husband that lady alute you know the one with the butterfly is that the one you're talking no no about? no no the first image with the with the rabbit oh yeah yes that's changa yeah changa wife they were married this guy here and changa were married she had a rabbit this guy's has some animals i thought they were you know there was some type of relationship oh oh no it's just for some movement in the piece. That's just a... And to balance it a bit. That's just a Carolism. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, who's this here? <laughs> <laughs> this one is Ayaruk. Ayaruk was a Mongolian princess. In fact, she was a very, very talented wrestler. Oh, cool. And her father was a distant co uh, cousin of Kublai Khan. Mm -hmm. And uh, the father wanted her to marry. And she says, no, I don't want to get married. Father says, but you must. And she says, okay, I'll marry the man that can beat me at wrestling. Right. But he has to put up 200 horses for the chance of wrestling me. Right. And if I win, I keep the 200 horses. <laughs> she never was beaten. In this way, she amassed 10,000 horses and she never married. <laughs> oh, she became a power broker, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> what, what, what period and in time? fact, you know, the opera Turandot yes. um, uh, was inspired by this woman. Oh, okay. And what, what period of time is this? Oh, let's see, Kublai Khan, that would be 1200, uh, 1100, 1200, somewhere around there. That's I a think. long time ago, man. 1200, 1300, somewhere around that. Now, these, these, these images, these, you know, these, uh, I guess, these symbols on the, on the, on the arm, they, they've gone through from that period of time even up to, until today, right? Yes, yes. I 
I research, let's see, fabric designs yes. for specific times and specific regions. And this would be some of them. This would be Mongolian. Oh, so Mongolian uh, symbols. Yes. Any particular meaning? No. <laughs> it's like, um, they're just like um, the fabric designs that they would have in their clothing. That's all. Okay. All right. Nice stuff, man. Do good work. And this too is on 22 karat gold leaf, as is this one, the uh, tiger here. Yes. Yeah. So this one is the tiger with the bamboo, and tiger is sim symbol. The tiger is actually the sex symbol of the Chinese zodiac, by the way. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. People born in the year of the tiger uh, are said to be the sex symbol of the. <laughs> <laughs> the zodiac. Are you born in the year of the tiger, Bill? Oh, I don't know. I, I don't know what Which that year means. are you born? Oh, maybe we shouldn't talk about this. Why not? Okay. Well, I was, I was born, what year? I was born in 1946. 46, let's see, year of, let's see, I think you're the year of the rooster. 46, no, no, year of, Year of the Boar, the pig, yeah. and you're very sympathetic, and you're very, you're a good friend, you're very loyal, but you tend to trust too much, and people would take advantage of you. It has been known to happen, yes, that's true. <laughs> Contrary to what some people think, <laughs> but you know, I, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling too sensitive about that, Carolyn. <laughs> I'm gonna move on. Okay, let's move on. All right. But, but thanks, for, thanks for giving me the 411 on that. <laughs> All right. Oh, we're at the end. Oh. You know, that was quick. Hey, I think that was we, fast. Yeah, you know, let's see. We, I think we must have missed somebody or something. I don't know. But anyway, so, so Carolyn, tell everybody, you're going to be at the show coming up uh, next month, right? In, yes. Uh, um, it's March 2nd through 5th. Uh, it's the La Quinta Art Festival in La Quinta, California, which is like uh, a couple a couple cities over from Palm Springs. Right. Just Palm Springs. And it's one of the foremost. It's the number one ranked art festival in the nation. Everybody tries to get into that one because it's, um, it's a fabulous show to do. They have a great um, production team. Uh, they, they're very friendly towards the exhibitors. They have great exhibitor um, services. And it's also marketed um, to internationally. Oh. So we have a lot of people coming in uh, from other countries for this show. Now, you know, a friend of mine, you know, wanted to know this about you. He said that maybe, are you selling a lot of your work in China? I'm sorry? Are you selling, a friend wanted to know, are you selling a lot of your work in China? Some, but not really. Mm -hmm. I tend not to try to do shows in China. I, I don't do shows in China. Uh, it's just the logistics of doing shipping uh, framed pieces and the duty involved and not, the only time you should ever do anything in a foreign country is if you have someone looking after your business in that country, because you right. can't tell what's going to happen to these pieces when they, once they get in the exactly, country. Exactly, exactly, that's true. Yeah. All right, so, you know, like, you, 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 I mean, let me just share this. I mean, I love you, Walt, I love you, and just a good person, and we're so blessed wow. to have you in, on the planet, man. You're doing good work. I'm just enjoying my time with you, Bill. Yeah. You are the, Best interviewer, you make me feel so at ease. Hey. Talking to a great friend. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like it's our second date. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Now I know you're the year of the boar. Yes, yes, yes. I'm that out today. And so, what, what's what, what your what's your sign? Your animal sign. I'm year of the dragon. What is that? What does that mean? Year of the dragon. They're very eccentric. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good luck year, uh, and people try to have their children born in the year of the dragon just because they think it'll bring them good luck and good fortune uh -huh. and 
prosperity and all that good stuff. Right. And in fact, you know, uh, Princess Fergie is it? What, what is the dude? Prince Andrew's ex-wife, yeah. Princess yeah. Fergie. Uh, her daughter, the first daughter, Princess Beatrice, uh, was born in Year of the Dragon, 1988, Year of the Dragon. She was born uh, on August 8th at 8 a.m. in the morning. So all these eights, Chinese people love eights because eight uh, connotes, it, it sounds like the same way you say pro to prosper or good luck. Right, okay. So anyone born in Year of the Dragon with all these eights is supposed to have all the good luck in the world. Hmm. So you've been having some good luck, right? I could always use more. Oh, spoken. We can always use more. Spoken like a true eight. Yes, there you go. <laughs> you know, in Hong Kong, um, they auction off the car license plate 8888 every year. And really? people pay millions of dollars just to use it for that one year. Whoa, man, what a, what a, I mean, who, who makes the money in that? The, the, the government? The government. <laughs> they auction it off every year. <laughs> I mean, is, is, isn't there a knockoff plate? No. <laughs> I wish. There, they knock off everything over there, right? They knock off that. Unfortunately, true. And that's another reason why I don't trust to uh, leave my artwork over there. In fact, one time, this is funny, one time when I was living in Hawaii and I was painting for, I was under contract to Images International of Hawaii at that time. And I was going up the escalator in Sears. And, you know, in the bottom of Sears, they have all these vendors, vendor booths selling, you know, they're independent of Sears. <laughs> I saw something out of the corner of my eye that looked vaguely familiar. So I came back around, went downstairs, and it was this Chinese company that had ripped off my images and had, um, made them into so-called gemstone originals manufactured in uh in china and they were selling this and they were so hideous looking I had to get hold of my attorney and put it you know stop them from doing that they weren't ever able to sell any of it it was so ugly looking <laughs> but, it, but it's just the concept right it's just the thought that they wouldn't ask you first yeah, you right. know uh, copyright has no meaning over there. Oh, it's just like the copyright is just steal what you want to. Right. Well, you know, they steal what they want. Um, patents mean nothing over there. Is that, a, is that a mindset or what is that? Well, they, they probably think uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. <laughs> I like the way you said that. Okay. I'll let, I'll let you slat on that one. All right. So, so Carolyn, you know, like, you know, I'm not going to ask that question you asked me not to ask. I'm not going to ask that question. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, you know, I, I just, I don't know where, I, mean, I don't want to end. It has to be going on, but I, we have to end someplace and sometime. But I'll tell you this, Carolyn, I'll, I'll, I'll make a commitment to you that I'll stay in touch as often as I can. That would be awesome. All right. I feel like I've met a very good friend and we will right. be friends for a long time right. yet. I feel the same, you know. So, you know, I just want to let everyone know that Carolyn Young is, you know, oh, remember that the clip I sent you the other day? Great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, that's before, ladies and gentlemen, that's before I, I ever met Carolyn. I was telling, I was saying, I can imagine her now back in her studio. You know, she gets in the morning, gets like kung fu, you know. She, yeah, the stars. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing the stars, the kung fu stars. Throwing <laughs> the kung fu stars. I would like to learn Tai Chi. Yeah, I, I think, you know, as an artist, I think that's a good thing, you know. It's, it's good for the health. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Tai Chi is actually just kung fu slowed down. Oh, okay. Do you know that? No, I, I, I had to think about it because in my mind, I know 
Tai Chi, it's, it's fast too, because it's a slow well, thing. It's slow motions, yeah. and, uh, but the moves are actually Kung Fu moves that are slowed down, just oh, about, awesome. more or less. So when are you going to start taking it? Whenever they have, <laughs> I'm not a morning person, whenever they have a class that's like in the afternoon or no, early. No, I got another B. They, the B to be at <laughs> five o'clock in the morning, you know that. They always have it at six in the morning, and yeah. I'm comatose. <laughs> well, I'm sure once you get a once you get a D, a, uh, you know, a DVD tape or something, you know, check it out. Like that. I could do that, but it's best when you do it with somebody. Oh, you of know, course. And all all the exercises. I go walking uh, every morning with my two dogs and my neighbor. And oh. we're in good health because of this. But w if my neighbor didn't go with me, and if I didn't have my dogs, I'd be a couch potato. Oh, really? Oh. Oh, yes. <laughs> what, what time do you go out walking? Usually around 9, 9.30, oh. somewhere around there. What time do you go to bed? I'm an old fart. <laughs> I get into bed at 9 at night. Oh, Is man. that terrible? <laughs> No, I think that's great. You know, I, I think that's good. Rest is good. Man. But I do wake up at six in the morning, six, seven o'clock, but it takes me about an hour to get. Yeah. To get, get awake. Yeah. It's like, I want to, I don't want to get up. Well, you exactly. know, so, so I'll be keeping in touch. You keep in touch. I'm going to, okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we've been having a very personal, intimate and fun conversation with Carolyn Young. She's going to be, you know, showing her work in California in a couple of weeks. So check it out. Uh, where's that again, Carolyn? What's that place? Uh, La Quinta Art Festival. La March Quinta. 2nd. Yeah, no, La Quinta, like La Quinta Inn and Suites. Yes. But it uh, has nothing to do with them. But it's in the city of La Quinta uh, in Southern California. Okay. And it's the dates are March 2nd through 5th. Four oh. days. So you guys get on over there, check her out. Buy oh, I'm, in, I'm in booth 226 if you yeah. want to come by and say yeah. hi. Great. Yeah. Go to booth 226, check it out. She's going to have this tape playing for you guys to look at and enjoy. Again, ladies and gentlemen, this is Bill Jordan here. Thanks for coming and thanks for loving us and sharing with us and had a great time. I hope you did too. So with that in mind, I just want to say, uh, you know, peace out and enjoy life. Hmm.